Uh, let's start with masking. So the first paper is titled Formal Verification of Masked Hardware Implementations in the Presence of Glitches by Rodrigue Blum, Hannes Gross, Rinat Isupov, Bettina Kuninghofer, Stefan Mangard, and uh, Johannes Winter. And Hannes will give the talk. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, before I'm going to start this talk with a brief summary about what we actually achieved in this work, I want to start um, with uh, the vision that we had in mind when we uh, started working uh, towards this topic. So the idea really was to create a formal tool or a formal method that will take a uh, masked circuit as an input and would then tell us whether it's securely masked or not. And if it's not securely masked, we want to, this a formal uh, tool to tell us uh, where things went wrong and why this happened. So what have we achieved so far? Uh, with our formal verification approach, we can verify glitchy circuits. And I just say glitchy because I'm really referring to hardware implementations and not just to uh, uh, a graphic way of expressing Boolean uh, formulas. Our approach doesn't require any uh, intermediate modeling steps, for example, to re-implement this in software, but works directly on the netlist. And it can be applied to different design, uh, design stages. So when you first uh, start to implement your hardware designs, you can uh, already put the first modules uh, in, in our tool, and then and it will tell you whether it's securely masked or not. But it can also be applied later on if you move towards your the end of the line in the digital design flow, and so when you have uh, the back end the data netlist and so on. It also works for higher order and for multivariate analysis. It is um, not tailored to a specific masking scheme, so it uh, works with every building masking scheme. And it allows you, and this is really helpful, to localize uh, where your flaw is. And First, uh, and most importantly, it gives a conclusive security statement. And uh, so the contents of the paper are the formal groundwork, but uh, we also give a concrete SMT-based instantiation of our uh, formal approach and test it against uh, some real practical examples. These examples uh, uh, include, uh, for example, uh, the DOM multipliers, the domain oriented masking multipliers, up to order four, but also bigger circuits like uh, the Ketchak S-Box up to order three. And as the biggest example, we have a first order protected AES S-Box that we uh, test against. So but let's start at the beginning. Um, why do we actually need a uh, formal verification or verification of uh, mass hardware implementations? Aren't there supposed to be any secure uh, masking schemes? So first of all, we need to talk about what is a secure masking scheme. And we have a very, um, uh, a very nice way to express side channel resistance, um, uh, which uh, is covered by this probing model, which goes back to the private circuits paper of Isha et al. And this basically, basically tells you that your mask implementation is side channel resistant. If it um, is secure, uh, against the probing attacker that has the ability to place up to deep probing needles on your circuit. And if the attacker cannot extract any secrets, then it's secure uh, in this probing model. And uh, so what is a masking scheme? A masking scheme is a, in some way a projection of this rule set by these probing models on the canvas of a, of a masked uh, implementation. So it uh, gives you the rules, but uh, the masking scheme itself is implemented uh, by designers of hardware, so there can be mistakes in the implementation of these schemes. And also the digital design flow that, um, that, um, that takes this circuit as an input and processes it further until it can be produced involves um, many tasks that change your netlist and also things can go wrong there. So, um, so we have, uh, for example, masking schemes that look at, uh, at this from a classical masking perspective, or a, a more modern way is from the, from the sharing perspective, but in the end, this is always a manual uh, uh, process to mapping these uh, schemes to the implementations. 
So implementation requires verification. And at least in theory, there are two approaches uh, one can think of. The first approach uh, to verify this mask uh, circuits is to either use empirical verification, which is the predominant form and is uh, uh, widely used in practice. But there's also uh, the uh, a formal way of proving this. And so the empirical verification works as follows. So you take, for example, your, uh, your secure, a, uh, supposedly secure AES core. You plug in an oscilloscope to it uh, and to the power line and extract side channel information. And then you run some statistical analysis on the power traces that will tell you whether it passes the test or fails. But the problem with this approach is that it's not uh, con conclusive. So if you don't find a flaw, you just don't know, maybe you haven't uh, used enough traces to, to test your implementation. Uh, and if a flaw is detected, you don't know if it's a real flaw and uh, where it actually origins from. So it could be on uh, everywhere from the, uh, um, from the circuit. Uh, it's also device specific and it can hardly be used during the design phase uh, of your circuit. So um, how about formal verification? Uh, well, I thought the picture would say more than a thousand words. So in terms of formal verification, in terms of practical formal verification of masked hardware implementations, there's really not much there. So if we would look at the software side, this would look a bit differently. Um, but yeah, so in the hardware side, at least when we started, there was really not much there. So, and with this said, I should also talk a bit about what we don't do or what we try to avoid in this, um, in our formal approach. So what we didn't want to do is a heuristical approach. Uh, so testing, for example, specific, um, specific properties of, uh, for a certain masking scheme. This would be, again, not conclusive and, uh, of course, not formally. Um, what has become very much popular, especially in the software world, um, is this notion of composability, which allows you to, to verify smaller parts of your circuit um, inside this composability notion. And this will then tell you if, you if all of the parts are secure and to plug them together, then in the end your whole circuit will be secure. So we didn't do this because uh, not all circuits um, or not all mask implementations fulfill this uh, composability notion in a straightforward way. Um, but um, this would be one meaningful extension to, to our approach. And as a matter of fact, so we are living in a really fast moving world. So there's already a paper on this. So there's uh, this paper on composable masking schemes in the presence of physical defaults by Faust et al that uh, does something very similar to our approach, uh, but um, in, uh, for this composability notion. So uh, enough said about what we don't do. Uh, what is it that we actually do? Uh, so we started with this project uh, about two years ago. And for a long time, we were really struggling to find something that really works. So we have found uh, some approaches that looked very promising for first order. <laughs> Uh, and univariate attacks, but uh, everything fails for higher order. So at some point we became really desperate um, until we remembered the roots of our information and computers engineering um, education. And so I think every student that uh, studies something like this has uh, heard something like, uh, if you're really desperate, if nothing works, then just go for free analysis. And so this is what we tried. So but the interesting question is now, what is the Fourier analysis of a circuit? And so when we're neglecting time and look at the circuit, and I also want to uh, use the slide to introduce the notation I'm going to use uh, in the rest of this presentation. So uh, I always assume that we have a secret that is masked inside this variable uh, SM that is masked by the mask MS. Uh, then we have some other masks uh, that are denoted with uh, M variables. And then we have some variables that are interesting or publicly known or something else, something that is not uh, security relevant, but also cannot provide uh, security like a mask could do. And these are these public variables or B variables here. 
So when we look at this uh, circuit and when we are neglecting time, then we can just write this as a Bolden equation. So this says nothing about time behavior, but uh, just for the moment. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is this Fourier expansion. And for those of you who um, were at the talk with Anne Cantor yesterday, already heard about this. Uh, this is also called the Walsh transform. And the way this works is basically we take this Bolden equation and map uh, two to minus one force to one. And then we can write each uh, equation in a very uh, uh, elegant form. So we can write a function over the input variables x as the, as the sum of the <coughs> Fourier coefficients times the Fourier correct, uh, characters. And these Fourier characters are nothing else than all combinations, all possible ordered combinations of variables that we have. So how would this look like? So we would end up with an equation that looks something like this. So this alpha here are my uh, coefficients. And then I add them up together times all combinations of my input variables x here. Um, so how does this help? Uh, well, there is this lemma of John Messi that basically tells us a Boolean function is statistically independent if all variables uh, for all variables, it, um, it holds that the subset of this set of variables, uh, despite the empty set, all the, the Fourier coefficients uh, should be zero. So what does this mean for our circuit? So if we set SM here, uh, the, um, the equation uh, S times uh, MS, so S is our secret that we want to protect. So when we look at the Fourier transformation of this circuit, then we see that for uh, that we only have non-zero coefficients for terms where we have s joined with a mask together. So this would be insecure if we would have an s alone here or an s with a publicly known variable. Um, but uh, so far, the circuit looks secure from our perspective. What's the problem with this is um, so if you go to bigger circuit. Uh, bigger circuits, and uh, later on we're going to exp uh, expand this to all possible signal timings, then this really becomes quite inefficient. And uh, yeah, if it becomes big enough, then it uh, gets impossible to do this. So instead of calculating the exact Fourier spectrum, uh, our idea was to just uh, do an approximation of this spectrum because uh, so we just want to know whether certain values are zero or not. And so with our approach, it, um, so we're doing a, an approximation and um, this can, can also come up with some ghost spikes here, which only can decrease our security. So we can come up with false alarms, but uh, if a circuit is securely masked and uh, uh, we do this approach, uh, then it should always say it's secure. This is what we prove. Um, and so the verification then works in, in three steps. The first step is that we label our inputs according to, to our Fourier analysis. So this basically uh, means that we just set the input labels here according to our variables, except for SM here, which is S joined with MS. Then we propagate these labels according to some rules, uh, which depend on the Fourier spectrum of the of the functions that we're calculating. And then we check for some secrets without any masks. So in this case, it would be a secure circuit. Um, so these propagation rules that we have are quite simple for, for stable signals. So when we, we uh, don't talk about, um, about timing, so we just label the inputs, for example, for this, uh, for this end gate here, according to the variables we have in there. For nonlinear gates like the end gates, we're doing the following rule. So we're um, creating this uh, labeling here where we join the empty set with the first input set of the of the uh, with the stable set of the first input and the stable set of the second input, and then we're doing also this uh, pointwise set difference of both uh, of both uh, labels here. For linear gates like an XOR, this looks a bit differently. So for this, we only do the, the last uh, part here, uh, where, we, where we do this point by step difference. And for registers and all of uh, just one input um, gates, we just propagate uh, the stable sets. 
So um, up to now, we totally neglected the timing, so I'm going to change this now. Um, so let's talk about glitches. So this is really something hardware specific. And I want to discuss this on a much simpler or a simpler circuit as we had before. This is really just two XORs, uh, a mask secret and, uh, and uh, some masks. And so when we look at the output of the first XOR, we would get S XOR MS, because this is what uh, SM is, XOR M1. And when we look at the output, we basically get S XOR M1, because we cancel out MS. So this looks secure up to now. Uh, however, if we assume that in the next cycle we would process uh, a different secret, <coughs> so we uh, also have uh, different input signals, but we assume that uh, this mask M1 here arrives a bit later than all the other signals here, what we get at the output is S hat uh, XOR M1, which um, doesn't look bad, right? But the problem is, so in the probing model, it is assumed that an attacker that places a probing needle on your circuit can continuously model what the circuit is doing at this point. So it would not only get uh, the, this, um, uh, this equation here, but it will also record the equation from the cycle before. And when you combine this, you can learn something about uh, the difference of the secrets that you had before. <coughs> so this is uh, then not secure, this is not what we want to have. Um, and um, if, we, if the, the signals then settle again, um, this flaw vanishes, and this is basically what we call a glitch, so a temporary violation of this probing assumption. So uh, in order to also cover this, we need to extend our rules, and we also um, added a second set here, which we call the transient set, which is um, here denoted in red. And uh, for inputs of the circuit, we just uh, do the same thing as for the stable set. Um, for nonlinear gates, we already have a rule that really covers the worst case, uh, so we haven't modified that. But uh, for linear gates, um, where also glitches can happen, as you have seen on the slides before, we're basically going to use the same nonlinear gate rule as before that uh, covers the, the worst case scenario. And then for registers, we say this transient set totally uh, disappears because uh, registers are blocking one cycle from, from the another. And, and so um, we then just propagate the stable set here again. So let's have a look at this on a, on a bigger example on the, on the circuit we, we had before at the beginning. Um, and we just look at the transient set because this is a, this is a purely combinatorial circuit. So again, we are labeling the input as before, and then we apply our nonlinear propagation rules, also for the XOR gate, so we get uh, this empty set, uh, the copy of the first input, the copy of the second uh, set of the second input, and then we also get the point by set difference. And so if we would, or if we are doing this for all gates here, uh, what we then see is that this circuit is indeed not secure uh, for transient signals and for glitches because we see that we end up uh, with signal combinations that contain the signal or the secret without any masks in them. And this indicates a, a flawed circuit. So uh, enough of the theory. We also took this approach and uh, put it into a tool and our tool chain works as follows. Uh, so we take uh, a circuit description, for example, based on Verilog or VHDL, parse this with an open synthesis tool, uh, which is called Diosis, and, and what we get from that is a circuit tree in JSON format that we are going to process further. So this contains the gates and the wires, so the connections of the, of the circuit. And then we need a bit of user interaction here because the user needs to tell us at the input of the circuit uh, which signals are critical, which are secrets, which are masks, which are, uh, which are public signals, and what is the maximum protection order that um, I want uh, the circuit to be uh, tested against. So we take this information, put it into a, a Python script that, um, that creates all the, the propagation rules that I talked before for, for the concrete circuit we're going to verify, and with this and the constraints, we're going to call a C3 set solver, 
And this is then going to tell us whether the circuit is secure or not. And if it's not secure, we can ask for where, where is the flaw located and what are the signals that produce the flaw. So with this implementation, um, um, we, um, so for, for this um, instance of our verification approach, we tried uh, a few ex exemplaric um, uh, circuits that are out there. Uh, so we started off with uh, verifying some basic building blocks of mask circuits, like the ISW and the Trichina end gates, uh, which are known to be flawed, and also our tool, uh, of course, indicates this. And we also tried some other building blocks like threshold implementations, end gate, and the domain oriented masking end gate. And for this, we uh, did the verification up to order five for different orders of the multiplier. And so in this diagram, you can observe the, the time and the, the verification order for, for different orders of the end gate. And as you see, uh, the, the um, verification effort grows exponentially. Uh, but what's also interesting to see is so finding a flaw is uh, much easier. So this is also what we observed in bigger circuits. Uh, when we actually found a flaw, then we would found this much faster than if we uh, solved this flaw again and uh, run the verification on this. But of course, we also tried it against bigger circuits. So we tried it, uh, this, for example, for Dom Ketchuk S-Box, so where first order verification took about 20 seconds. Uh, third order verification about 25 minutes. Um, we also tested uh, uh, Files S box, Files APN, and uh, the biggest circuit was a domain oriented uh, masking protected AES S box for first order, which took between five and 10 hours of parallel checking in order to uh, verify this to be a secure circuit. So this brings me to the conclusion of the talk, and I want to end with a positive note on the verification of masking or informal verification of masking. So we really think that there is hope uh, for practical formal verification of mask circuits and that this really can become not only an alternative but a replacement for empirical and heuristical methods that are nowadays uh, the predominant form of verifying this mask circuit. Um, we feel that, that there's uh, still a long way to go to, to cover everything and to make this uh, as, uh, so efficient that we can approve complete uh, circuits and for higher protection orders. But there, there's also lots of room for improvement. And one way to go, for example, is this composability and the combined form of this composability notion and so on. So there are really some uh, ideas out there how we can improve uh, our approach and this is just the first step. So thank you. So we have time for some questions. Suppose you have a circuit which is secure without glitches, and then with glitches it's insecure, and yeah. the circuit is very big. Yes. Then uh, the problem is that, okay, you have to decide, do, I mean, is it really insecure or not? Because in practice, I don't know, if you want to make it secure against glitches, it will be, I don't know, much bigger or something like that. So you probably need to add some registers. Yeah, but, but the thing is, so uh, we have the stable set rules and the transient set rules. And so the first thing that we do when we practically verify, because this is really a tool that we use uh, when we are um, going to implement new, new stuff, then we, so this is really a practical tool that, we, that is already in use. The first thing we do is we just uh, test for the stable set rules. This doesn't have this uh, huge exponential blow up. So this is, works really much, much faster than, for, uh, than also applying these trends in set rules. So this is the first thing we do before we go to the trends in set rules. Uh, is there scope like to add some probabilities in the, in this setting like to say okay what's the probability of actually having a glitch like because I, no. I, I don't know in the no, no. Uh, in design so we don't take uh, concrete signal timings into account because this can also completely vary so if you're going to produce an ASIC for example and you take two uh, different devices uh, then this can also have completely different signal timings or this could vary in when you have different environmental conditions. Yeah, but you can take them somehow. You could, but I don't think this would make uh, things easier, actually. So right now, it's, I think it's better to just verify against the worst case 
uh, then taking uh, concrete signal timings into account be because also this assumptions that you would have the signal timings is not quite realistic in, in the end. Okay. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, I have a question for like uh, at the end of your talk you said that you could do parallel checking for the verification of uh, mask implementations. So I guess when you do parallel checking is for checking each secret, like each bit of the secret separately? Yes. Okay, right. so can you explain in a few words how you can do that? Because you put labels on the nodes, mm -hmm. so you need to put labels for each secret, so how can it be faster with the uh, uh, parallel? Uh, yeah, basically what we are doing, we're just modifying uh, the labels at the input by just removing the, the other secrets. So for example, if you take an AES S box, yeah. you have eight secrets in there, right? Uh, and verifying against all of the secrets is quite time consuming, so what you want to do this in parallel. And so what we're doing is we're uh, taking all the labelings that we would have, but just removing the seven <coughs> other secrets. Like if it was public variables? Oh, like if it was public variables, for instance, or you just remove the nodes there? Uh, we keep the masks. Okay. This is what we keep because this is what we need because it can also become insecure because of this mask in some way. Uh, but we remove the secrets. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again and we move to the next. <laughs>